Hello empaths, let's do some healing. Like most trendy psychologically oriented terms, the term dark empath is something you can get a wide variety of definitions on. And its characterization, you can argue even based on the term itself, is suggesting some sort of villainous archetype, which I think is a less helpful approach to understanding it. Dark empath is like the thing you say you're gonna become on your close friend's Instagram story when your ex texts you at 5 a.m. again. And people on TikTok have run with the term. I think because it's a kind of cool way of describing some type of conflictual behavior that either describes someone who is extremely toxic or someone who is maybe necessarily toxic as a defense mechanism in a cruel world. Some TikToks basically say both. Now, there is some academic basis for it. A scholarly article from 2021 by Haim et al. describes it as a novel psychological construct characterized by high empathy and dark traits. Simple enough, why didn't you just say that? It's an empath that's dark. The term dark traits itself originates from a 2002 paper which coins the term dark triad to describe the non-pathological personality traits of Machiavellianism, subclinical narcissism, and subclinical psychopathy. Ooh, what, what does that mean? So Machiavellianism is the quality of strategically manipulating people in your environment with low regard or no sense of morality in order to accomplish some sort of goal. This is like the Azula personality type if you've watched Avatar The Last Airbender. The good one. Narcissism, which is a another term that could be defined a million ways, but is commonly defined as basically obsessing with oneself or obsessing with one's own needs. And psychopathy, which another one of those. It's kind of hard to define, but basically it's like having antisocial behaviors and not seeming to have empathy beneath the surface. And this is the thing with these kind of categorizations. Ultimately, they're socially defined and they're kind of hard to extricate on objective terms. Even the studies themselves are based on questionnaires of psychology students. So it's like opinions of other people who have similar education and acculturation to the authors. It's like if I were to do a study about whether rice and beans is the best side dish and the way I did it was questioning 200 other Dominicans. I'm Dominican. You can't really tell but that's a Dominican flag. But this also doesn't mean that rice and beans isn't the best side dish, and it is. Nor that the dark triad, if not a definite science-based phenomenon ultimately, and instead a kind of a reductivist mystification of social behavior, can at least be an interesting construct to analyze things people do. And so that's what I'm gonna try to do. I'll talk about dark empathy today as a helpful theory for the behavior of ourselves and others we know. I'm kind of fascinated by dark empathy, something about it, I don't know, something about the way it, it may characterize people who try to be empathetic and understanding of other people's feelings, but have also been traumatized to an extent that pushes them to go without their needs met, causing them to harbor great resentment, stress, and self-esteem issues which lead to self-victimization and manipulative behaviors. A classic example is a friend or partner or somebody who has an issue with you and has a close relationship with you, but instead of telling you what their issue is, communicating their feelings, they give you the silent treatment. They sit there and make you feel uncomfortable and emotionally hurt enough to match the feeling that they felt or to push you to ultimately ask what's wrong or ultimately feel like there's something wrong with the way you are. Waiting until you seem properly hurt so that they can re-engage with you and maybe never even acknowledge what happened in the first place. That's emotional manipulation. It comes in different flavors, but it's emotional manipulation. It's rather than communicating something that hurts to the other person and working with them to try to figure out what the best course of action is, it's just trying to hurt other people's feelings in some type of way without communicating. It's just trying to behave in a way that they know will make you feel bad. This could also be making passive aggressive remarks about the thing that bothers them. And if you take exception to it saying, oh, it's just a joke or you're just exaggerating. It could be having an emotional outburst when other people try to hold you accountable because that way you get to direct attention towards how you've been hurt and your own victimization instead of having to admit to and work with what you've done wrong. Dark empathy is often wielding your emotional sensibility and sensitivity as a weapon to ensure that people meet you and your needs and your wants. And truthfully, it's very common for people to act this way to some degree. I definitely have at points. I'm sure many of you have. And what's cool about that idea, if we choose to think critically, 
is that it allows us to examine the complexity of trauma responses and bad behavior. So let's talk about why. But first, let's talk about today's sponsor, Aura. Speaking of manipulative people, data brokers, have you heard of them? They sell your information to scammers, to spammers, and anybody else that might try to target you. And so all this personal information that you might have is out there. That's where today's sponsor, Aura, can help you out. They can show you which data brokers are using your information and selling it and automatically submits opt-out requests for you. If you've ever had the experience of looking your name up on Google and seeing what comes up and not liking what you see because it's very private like I have then you'll know what I'm talking about and cleaning up this information can also help you with clearing out the amount of spam emails that you get it protects you from potential hackers who could use that information to run scams or to enter different accounts that you have and it does a lot more that can help protect you on many different bases there are features like antivirus VPN password management parental controls identity theft insurance and more without you having to download a lot of different apps to cover each of those things. It's easy to set up and it's affordable. That way, without breaking the bank too much and without having to download all these different apps, you get to have a little bit of peace of mind. And I want that for you. That'll help you. You can go to Aura.com slash Elliot Sang, that's E-L-L-I-O-T-S-A-N-G, for a two-week free trial, also linked below in the description. Thanks so much to Aura for sponsoring this video, and let's get back to it. So why do people become dark empaths? I think a better question might be first, why do people emotionally manipulate? And the answer is unfortunately that it's very normalized. There are a lot of things that we don't even consider emotional manipulation in the standard sort of rough sense, but are emotionally manipulative. Like for instance, the aforementioned silent treatment. And if you ask me, this is what happens when you have societies built on capitalism and imperialism, manipulating people violently in order to hoard resources for a small group of people. I mean, think about it. What could be more manipulative than genociding people, stealing their land and resources, and then forcing them to learn your language and enter your schools because you're the civilized civilization that they need to learn from and emulate. What could be more manipulative than owning people's bodies and the labor that they use and convincing them that it's because you are superior to them as a human being? If you want to know what it is that causes so many people to act manipulatively to get ahead, you can start with your history textbooks. I think the way that society is organized politically and economically has a huge impact on these personal dynamics, these private dynamics that we see as causing people to have these traumatizing experiences and these trauma responses. For example, as we talked about in our recent video about love and reality shows, the woman's role in the family, traditionally, historically, has been tied to providing for the man's spiritual, physical, material needs as an embodiment of his own capital, which makes him feel better about having to labor all day for somebody else's. Even as societies have developed to involve women as laborers and in positions of political and economic leadership, popular constructs of what it means to be womanly, to be feminine, effeminate, retain their basis in promoting the docility and objectification of women, often bolstered by institutions like the church. And so growing up in a typical environment, in our case we're looking at western environments, but this can be said of many different places from the US on down, as a woman is growing up in a family unit that teaches her to prioritize other people's needs above hers, especially male needs, we normalize something like motherhood as a process with which she is the one who suffers, she is the one who has to do far more work, and yet it is based on somebody else's decision to be a father equally or even more so than her decision to be a mother. And so you get things like popular influencers talking about basically raising two children because their husband needs to be negotiated with in order to do basic stuff for their baby. This is a process by which society systematically minimizes your needs. So it's not shocking that the people in your life in that society might act accordingly gaslighting you into believing that you're selfish or you're making a fuss about something that you need, punishing you for hurting a man's feelings perhaps, etc. Maybe you had a mother 
that was unnecessarily harsh with you, as if to teach you that to be a woman, you have to put your needs to the side, as if knowing that wanting to be loved and knowing what it means to be loved and cared for is actually a disadvantage in the world you live in. Maybe you become a dark empath in response to all of this. As a way of realizing, you can superficially give people what they want to see out of you, and now that you hold that value with them, you can use that value to manipulate them to give you what you want ultimately. Pushing family members and prospective partners to do things that will favor you monetarily because of the way you look like such a well-behaved and advanced woman. You know, just generally speaking. We're not here to just talk about women as well. Bros, I've not forgotten you. Maybe you grew up in an environment where your masculinity was always in question, where you didn't meet the standard of strength, of competence at sports, confidence socially, attractiveness. Maybe you always felt coldness from your father as a display of what it means to be a man, to be unfeeling except for cases of anger. Maybe you always felt pushed by society to go down that path of being a worker for somebody else and at no point in the meantime feeling like you're being adequately recognized as somebody whose needs and desires are important, as somebody who, despite being different, is cool, is lovable. So maybe you start watching masculinity influencers, folks like Andrew Tate or Hamza that teach you that, yes, this is the only way to be successful and to be happy in society is to give society what it wants. It wants Wants men to act this way and that's because it's the best way to be you just need to hit the gym relentlessly you need to treat women like objects ultimately you maybe need to watch entrepreneur influencers to inspire you to start a business that at first really has very little value that you can provide but manipulate people through your image and through your understanding of their insecurities to give you the money and resources that you need to eventually make a bunch of money off of them to eventually be quite rich Maybe you're a person from a marginalized background of some sort, racially, when it comes to sexuality, gender, and you might manipulate your community into supporting your business or political career because of representation. Maybe you're an activist who helps organize fundraisers based on issues that society is currently very focused on and then profiting off of those fundraisers in the meanwhile, as well as all the attention. Maybe you're a guy who acts woke to get power among women in left-wing spaces who become emotionally vulnerable vulnerable around you. All of these behaviors involve what we consider some type of empathy, reading into the feelings of others, presenting to them some type of reassurance that you'll help with those feelings, and ultimately using the credibility you build to get what you want. Maybe you're not even doing anything that bad. You're just a bit guarded, a bit depressed, and you're not communicating very well with people you love. Whatever the case may be, the question remains. I started this video off by basically poking fun at TikTok, which I actually really like TikTok. I like using it all the time. Once you train your algorithm to look at cool lefty stuff, it becomes kind of a great source for good content from people of all types of backgrounds. And that's besides it being a shady capitalist enterprise and blah, blah, blah. But like the whole reason I found the dark empath thing in the first place was from a video by Jamila Bradley or Bright Black Honey on TikTok, which was in turn a stitch of another video about people doing other people's emotional work for them. In the TikTok, Bradley notes the dangers of assuming people's feelings for them without truly asking them how they feel and how this type of behavior, which is usually a trauma response, leads to flattening and dehumanizing others, turning them into characters in your life rather than autonomous human beings. A lot of the work in being connected and caring for others is taking the time to remember and attempt to understand that they're living a different experience than us, that we don't actually know what they're thinking and feeling. As somebody that at times of my life identified as an empath in the toxic way, and as somebody that struggles to this day with people pleasing and feeling like I'm in trouble, a lot of the decoding I was doing was actually a trauma response, and it wasn't very respectful to the people that I was in relationship with. Of course, it's important to know whether you're being manipulated or whether these are emotionally abusive tactics like the silent treatment or having someone expect you to constantly be an emotional caretaker, but that's not what I'm talking about. There have been so many times in my life that I was really struggling with self-esteem, that I was really struggling with feeling not good enough. And so the conclusions that I would come to about other people's words, their tones, their facial expressions wasn't very regulated. I oftentimes assumed the worst. Or on the other hand, I felt helpless and victimized against other people's feelings. I often felt people's feelings were a manipulation tactic or being used against me because I wasn't doing the work to 
deal with my discomfort and speak to them like a person to ask them, hey, what does it mean when you make this face? Or what is that tone of voice? I think there's more to the story than taking on the emotional work of others. I think this can often be a really subtle and insidious way we avoid doing the work ourselves. One of the most joyous and magical parts of being a human is that we're all individuals and we have this short, brief, precious time to get to know ourselves and get to know each other. When we start writing fiction, when we start thinking, feeling, and reacting for other people instead of engaging with them authentically, we lose out on this experience. We end up feeling really misunderstood while the people around us feel the same way. We end up feeling alone or victimized while the people around us wonder what we're thinking and what we're doing. When we decide to be vulnerable, transparent, and we do it in a way that's healthy, right? I'm not saying asking what's wrong with you or being interrogative or assumptive either. I'm saying when we truly attempt to engage with other people's emotional experiences from a place of good faith, we're able to deepen our relationships and understanding of that person and ultimately live richer, healthier, more full lives. I think it's also important to highlight that there are characteristics of abuse that come with characterizing and stating someone's emotional experience for them to them. Telling people that you know better how they feel than they do when you haven't done the diligence to ask them is such a violating experience. Being told that somebody knows more about your internal world and your motivations is an incredibly dehumanizing experience as well. If the goal is connection, if the goal is belonging, if the goal is feeling safe together, safer together, then we need to start being brave enough to ask and we need to start being brave enough to answer honestly too. And this is what my boy Paolo talks about in Pedagogy of the Oppressed as sectarianism. It's this choice, no matter how noble your intentions are, to mythicize and thereby alienate the people around you. To assume you know how they are and how things work ahead of time, as opposed to radicalization, which criticizes and thereby liberates. He notes that we can often easily attribute this to the right wing, quite accurately, assuming, for instance, that all trans women are just sick and confused or predatory. But it's also often taken up by left-wingers in response to the sectarianism of the right. In a similar way that we can become more dark because we're opposed to other dark people. And rather than say everything is subjective and we can't think critically or analyze things ultimately because we all just have different views and we should just let people be, or assuming that the world is totally objective and that we've already figured it out and that it works a certain way, we have to engage in a dialectical process between subjectivity and objectivity. We have to engage in real dialogue with people. We have to analyze them from what we know and understand and also ask them what they think and feel and regard both of those things as valuable in trying to help them and ourselves. Freire writes that the radical committed to human liberation does not become the prisoner of a circle of certainty within which reality is also imprisoned. On the contrary, the more radical the person is, the more fully he or she enters into reality so that, knowing it better, he or she can better transform it. This individual is not afraid to confront, to listen, to see the world unveiled. This person is not afraid to meet the people or to enter into dialogue with them. This person does not consider himself or herself the proprietor of history or of all people or the liberator of the oppressed, but he or she does commit himself or herself within history to fight at their side. If we're going to heal from the traumas of being flattened, being dehumanized, having our needs assumed and best interests assumed for us, not being truly asked what we need and attended to, and simultaneously not truly being thought about deeply to examine what we do or don't understand, if we're going to heal from the trauma of being treated unequally, we have to be radical. We have to always be criticizing ourselves and always attending to our own needs. We have to always be criticizing others and always attending to their needs at the same time. We have to stop assuming we know what other people really think and want and acting accordingly, something that the dark empath always does. The problem with empaths, I think, is really the assumption if I act like I just know people's feelings already without them telling me because I've got some type of gift or skill set, I minimize their ability in their relationship with me to have any autonomy, to actually tell me what they feel and ask me for what they need, which is ultimately supposed to be their responsibility because that's supposed to be part of their autonomy. And no matter how accurate you think your assumptions are, how many books you've read, how many push-ups you've done, that 
approach will ultimately lead to conflict, hatred, and lack of progress. Now, what's also interesting about Bradley's TikTok is one of the top comments. It says, hyper-intellectualization and reading an environment or person's emotional state has saved me all my life. It's hard turning that off with people, even if they aren't hurting me. And this is ultimately quite true too. A lot of these things we do for a reason. At the end of the day, much of the success that we have in a lot of environments comes from not fully trusting other people. It comes from us having to manipulate our environments in order to meet immediate needs. This is part of why nobody's perfect. In such an imperfect environment, we rely on imperfect methods to get our needs met. But if we really want to heal, and if we really want to build a better world, then we need to start examining how much of this tendency we really need to hold on to and how much of it is holding us back. Reading your environment might really be helpful in situations with strangers or around people who don't communicate well, but when we actually meet people who do communicate well, who do require our trust to build real lasting bonds, will we be able to do it? Not without healing not without analyzing. In conclusion, don't fetishize dark empathy as a good or bad thing. The dark empath is not some mystical character that keeps thwarting you at every turn and it's not some underrated anti-hero that's actually in charge and knows best for everything. Dark empathy is just a thing that people inhibit in difficult environments. And if we're not gonna stop doing that thing outright, we at least need to be self-aware. I wish I had a punchy ending, but that's the best I got. Thank you to our channel members for subscribing and joining the channel for $5 a month. You can also receive the benefits that they have, which are cool bonus content and special emojis that you can use, including this cute one of my cat. Until next time, goodbye.